Welcome to part two of my uh, polymorph deck tech. Uh, if you haven't seen part one, there's a video link down here. Check that out first, please. I won't be going back over the entire list in this video, uh, just because a lot of it would be redundant if I were to. Uh, I, that being said, I will go over the uh, differences between this mon the mono blue list you just saw and this is it list, other than the obvious. And I will also cover some of the potential cards that you can use to fill the flex slots that were mentioned earlier uh, outside of the lands. So let's start with that, shall we? The first, everything here is the same, including the counts. Um, deck list is in the description if you want to check that out. Um, so everything there, just as it was. I'm also running four Is It charms in here. Actually, need to correct myself. Okay, well, well, it's fine, it's fine. Not everything is the same here. Not everything. Uh, I need to talk about you first, though. <laughs> My bad. It's late here. Alright, so counter-target non-creature spell, unless this controller pays two, deal two damage target creature, draw two, discard two. This is flexibility incarnate. For this deck, this is the kind of flexibility that we want. I would submit to you that it's better than Dissolve, and it's better than Disrupting Shoal. This is the main reason why we're splashing red at least in the main board. Uh, this just gives us the ability, again, similarly to anticipate. We hold up our answers, we hold up a kill spell or a counter spell, and then if we don't happen to need it, we'll do some faithless looting. And it helps us to find our combo if we don't need to play it for its control elements. Uh, that's why I think Is It Charm is so good in this slot. It Again, it is a soft counter, so when we get to the late game it will mean a bit less, and because it only deals two damage, similarly, when it gets the late game, it'll mean a little bit less, but that looting will always be something, unlike a card like uh, Spell Pierce or Mana Leak. You can always loot to try to find an answer. Now, because we have a, a way to loot, because we have Draw Discard, that means that we're actually incentivized to drop Imrakul into the graveyard. Because we're incentivized to do that, because we'd rather drop Emrakul where he can shuffle back into our library and be hit with Polymorph, uh, and we'd rather not discard a card that might do something, Emrakul's dead in our hand. Uh, because of that, we actually take out, or I take out anyway, one Rune Chanter's Pike. The one that you see up there, that's the only Rune Chanter's Pike left. In the Mono Blue list, we ran two because other than discarding the hand size or getting thought seized, we don't really have to worry about or I guess despise. We don't have to worry about um, Emrakul shuffling the graveyard back, and so we get more value out of the Rune Chanter's Pike. Uh, that being said, Rune Chanter's Pike is a strong enough card that I still keep it as a one of. The only way that I wouldn't do that, let's say that you can't afford Serum Visions, which is fine, <laughs> certainly. Uh, now that you're running red, this can be a Faithless Looting. Just find your combo a little bit more quickly, discard the Emrakul so that it doesn't stay in your hand, it can actually be hit with Polymorph. That's another reason why you want to run red, potentially. You don't want Emrakul to just be stuck in your hand, not really doing anything. Um, scooch you guys out of the way. Alright, so now we have another slot that's open then, because we took a Rune Chanter's Pike out. I put Spell Snare in here. Now, Spell Snare can also be in the main board for the Mono Blue list. Uh, it hits... I, I think that its best usage is Fighting Affinity, because Cranial Plating and Arcbound Ravager do so much work against our deck. Yes, you can also hit um, a Tarmogoy, for instance. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's quite a clock uh, to have to be up against. Um, but mostly, I would say that it's for the Affinity matchup, where their powerhouses, Cranial Plating and Arcbound Ravager, can just make the game so much in, uh, against you, so much out of your favor. Um, so that's why that's in. And the reason it wasn't in there in the last instance is because uh, it could have, but I, I thought that my flex slots were better spent on other cards. Before I get to those recommendations, though, let's go over the land base. Now, because we have to run red, <laughs> oh, only five basic islands. Or at least that's what I'm running right now. Thankfully, though, all of them get to be this. They get to be this art, my favorite art, because I am 13 years old. 
And not only that, but because I am 13 years old and because we're running red, we can run the Origins Georgia O'Keeffe Mountain. So, um, <laughs> I know, real mature, real mature. <laughs> All right, but first, but first. So, five islands. I'm running four steam vents in this list because we're going to be running fetch lands, of course, of course. A single mountain, that's all. It's much less crucial. Now, well, I'll explain that in just a second when I get done with all of my lands, but uh, there is a, a little bit of a dis-synergy that's potentially going on here. Four scalding tarns to be able to find the islands or the mountain, obviously. For Misty Rainforest, because four fetch lands just is not enough. If we only have the four fetch lands, then effectively we have four, five, nine. Nine ways to get that red mana. And for the sideboard especially, when we side in, one of our cards is red red in the cost. That makes it a little bit tricky. <laughs> You, you want to have two red for that. I actually would have lost a game on turn four had I not had the red red um, when I did. So Misty Rainforest just gives us more chances to find the steam vents, but it also does a, a couple other things. It could let your opponent believe that you're on Rug Twin, which has its own advantages to be sure, um, or Timur Twin, I guess we'd say, because they run Tarmogoyf in their list, they run Ancient Grudge in the sideboard, uh, so you can flash it back with green. Um, so if you can throw your opponent off on that, then by all means go for it. But another thing that it does is it makes, if they know Polymorph, then they might think that you have the Misty Rainforest to go for Dryad Arbor. And they might be playing around, let me see, he can fetch end of turn for Dryad Arbor and go off the next turn. So if they know what you're doing, or if they know that you're on Polymorph, you might actually be able to trick your opponent. Um, that's another thing that Travis Wu has done for this deck. I, I have taken some inspiration, although I've disagreed with him on uh, some of the... or on Dryad Arbor, specifically. Now, lastly we have Desolate Lighthouse, which I kept saying is Desperate Lighthouse on the, on the videos. Uh, since we're running red, we might as well, might as well get some uh, looting out of it, I suppose. Um, I, I guess it sort of speaks for itself, doesn't it? The ability to play the long game, if you and your opponent are just both digging for answers, then keep your mana open, and just at the end of turn, if you didn't need to do anything with it, get rid of something you don't need, find something that you hopefully do need, and go from there. Now, with all that being said, uh, if I'm having troubles, trouble with red mana, why don't I just simply run Cascade Bluffs? Why don't I run Sulphur Falls? And that's reasonable, but if I do that, Vidalkin Shackles, it's a lot less awesome. Let me bring that card back up. Uh, Vidalkin Shackles counts the number of islands specifically that I control, just islands. I'm running five basics, four steam vents, that's it. Now, nine is plenty <laughs> for most purposes. Nine is enough. But uh, when you're running four Ink Moth Nexi, when you're running des Desolate Lighthouse, I was about to do it again, call it Desperate, um, you have quite a few that aren't actually islands themselves, and so that can hurt you a little bit. Vidalkin Shackles might just go in favor of something like Cascade Bluffs or Sulphur Falls. Feel more than free to change that up, but if you do, try to find another win condition that you can put in that slot, because Vidalkin Shackles is a workhorse. Absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt. You can try another cloud form. You can try another batter skull. Uh, I wish that there happened to be a living weapon uh, card that had haste. That was a reasonable cost. There's the six drop, and that one's terrible because it's a six drop in this format. Um, but you can try something like that if you're on a budget and you can't afford, uh, say, the batter skull, for instance. You can try a flare husk. That's a one drop. <laughs> that, that'll help you a little bit, I'm sure. Uh, Mortipod, maybe, but you'd also have to sacrifice the uh, the germ in order to uh, in order to actually get the ability out of it. Uh, some budget alternatives. Now, I mentioned earlier that there are some flex slots in the deck. Uh, the dissolves and disrupting shoals became is it charms. A rune chantress pike became a spell snare. 
Repeal doesn't have to be in there. Some alternatives that I can bring up to you, in addition to the ones that you have seen or see before you now. Uh, you may notice that the way that I'm playing this deck, it's certainly more of a control deck. I could dig for the combo a little more easily, you know. I could play uh, Peak, for instance. I could play, I guess, Thought Scour, but maybe not. Uh, I could play Sleight of Hand. This one because it's in the modern frame. This one because, I'll admit, she's kind of cute. And this one because that skull right there. It looks like it's going, huh? <laughs> At least that's how I take it. Uh, I rather like these arts. And plus, they're the only ones I have. So, <laughs> um, if you have sleight of hand, you can put those in in place of um, these slots, some number of these slots. Uh, in fact, you can actually even replace some other counter spells if you'd like. You can replace Anticipate, though I strongly recommend that you not do that. Um, it'll help you to find the combo a little bit more quickly. And if you're actually not trying to be a control deck, if you're trying to just rush out the combo and have some incidental counter magic, then by all means, sleight of hand could be the way to go. You can even take out more counter spells if you want to side in peak to know when the coast is clear, but if you're siding in that, you might not... I mean, after all, you're looking for information with Gitaxian Probe and, pre and peak to know when you can try to go off, but if you don't have any counter magic to say no, kind of doesn't matter, does it? Well, anyway... So, that's just an idea. By all means, sleight of hand is something that you can try. Now, to the sideboard. To the sideboard. Um, actually, before I get to the sideboard, one other quick thing, because this, this came up in the comments a few times when I was, uh, when I was piloting this deck. Um, why do you have to have Emrakul? Do you have to have Emrakul? Uh, why not try something else? Uh, a friend of mine, Paul, the guy who actually <laughs> let me have this playmat because he is awesome like that, um, asked me why don't I run Grizzlebrand, or have I tried Grizzlebrand? And I have, and Grizzlebrand got me killed twice, actually. Well, in, in one instance, I might, I might still have died, uh, but I would have killed his creature in the process and potentially set him back quite a bit. So, you, you want Emrakul, but there are some alternatives. Let me talk about those really quickly. Um, first of all, there's Grizzlebrand, and that's what seems like the most obvious one, right? I mean, Sneak and Show and Legacy is running Emrakul and Grizzlebrand for a reason, right? Um, or Vintage Oath, I think, is the, the strongest example of where Emrakul is actually not as good as Grizzlebrand. That deck runs in Vintage... It, granted, it's a Vintage deck, but it's running three Grizzlebrands <laughs> in, in zero Emrakuls. Uh, but the reason for that is because the Vintage Oath deck can kill you on the turn that Grizzlebrand comes out if you have Grizzlebrand, because you can draw 14 cards and then storm kill them. You can't, on that turn, you can't really do that in modern, at least not as far as I'm aware. And you certainly can't do that on curve. You certainly can't go, you know, turn one, cantrip, turn two, anticipator, counterspell, turn three, cloud form, turn four, polymorph, Grizzlebrand, kill you. At least there isn't a way that I can think of off the top of my head that you can do that. And maybe you can, but even if you can do something like that, some of these slots would have to change, and that waters down the ability of the deck to cantrip to find the combo, or to control until you find the combo. Uh, so even if you could do something like that, Grizzlebrand just isn't as good. Um, maybe You can make a case that Grizzlebrand actually might be better against Burn, because he has lifelink after all. Um, and that's, that's true, but that's one match, and even then, one of my alternatives uh, to Grizzlebrand is probably better in that case, and I'll, I'll tell you what that is in just a moment. Um, how about another one, like, uh, here's, here's a good one. Blightsteel Colossus. <laughs> this one's pretty sick. You are, after all, going on the Infect plan already. It has Indestructible. <laughs> it has Trample. It's much cheaper, I would imagine. So why not run something like Blightsteel Colossus? And that's not necessarily a bad idea, I would submit, but Blightsteel Colossus has much the same problem as Grizzlebrand. You can't kill them on that turn, and at least this one protects itself somewhat, right? Uh, maybe if you're running Grizzlebrand and four Disrupting Shoals, 
Maybe. Okay, so you can, like, find a Force of Will style effect to, uh, to protect the Grizzlebrand. I can see that. Um, the Indestructible on Blightsteel also makes some good sense. It's usually not as good, however, as protection from colored spells, <laughs> generally speaking. Uh, it's also a lot easier to block. If your opponent just wants to chump with a Deceiver Exarch, or some other common creature like Tassiger, Gurmog, Angler, Siege Rhino, something like that, they can, and they have, <laughs> they have the ability to do so. A lot harder to do with Emrakul or another flyer. Well, what about Iona? Iona does make some sense when you're going against combo decks, because, again, you can't kill the opponent on that turn, and Iona, I mean, even if you have Emrakul, you can't kill them on that turn. <laughs> Unless you found some silly way to have a Lightning Greaves in here, or something like that, a Swiftfoot Boots. You're, you're not killing them on that turn. Um, so that being the case, Iona does stop combo decks, and that's, that's a reasonable choice. If you don't have Emrakul, and you want to try Iona, um, some issues with that, Iona cost about as much as the Emrakul anyway, right? They're in the same ballpark. Uh, they both got the Modern Masters 2 reprint that they needed so badly. Uh, they both got... they were both printed in Zendikar Block. Uh, I think Emrakul might be a little bit more available because Emrakul had the pre-release promo uh, that I have, that I'm running. Um, but... so if you're trying to do it for budget's sake, Iona is probably not where you want to be. Uh, Iona also has the issue of not really... I I yes, you stop the combo decks, but if you're playing against a fair deck, and they already have a board well, well established enough, Iona doesn't really save you. Remember, we're not really doing the Gifts Ungiven package, um, where they're playing a lot more in the way of control, so that um, if you stick the Iona, you can just you can control the board a little bit more until Iona hits them to death. Emrakul shuts that down. If they can't answer the Emrakul, and Emrakul's harder to answer, if they can't answer the Emrakul on that next turn, then they they won't answer Emrakul. I only give them a few more chances to. Um, for example, let's say that I have Iona, I stick her, she's <laughs> seven flying, um, and I have to swing three times to kill my opponent. Even if they're in a board position where, um, and yes, you can also make the case for Elish Norm, but I'll get to that in just a moment. If they're in a case where they can't cast any more spells, but they already have a Gurmog Angler out, they already have a Siege Rhino out, they already have Tassiger, something like that, they have land creatures, they might still be able to outrace us. Once we stick Emrakul, it's done. At most it's a two turn clock, you know, without, without some Soul Sisters life gain shenanigans or something like that. Uh, at most it's a two turn clock and they're out of permanence. They're out of the game. But yes, you can, you can try Iona, put two Ionas in the sideboard to fight combo decks. Hey, Go for it. <laughs> Give it a shot. I, I own no Ionas, and so I haven't tried it on pap in paper myself, but I have tried it online, and I just don't think that it works as well. Elishnorn. This is another reason why I, I think that the Gifts package can do Iona and Elishnorn better, because you get the choice. You can Gifts Ungiven for Unburial Rites, and whichever one will get you out of the situation you're in. Um, when you Polymorph, you have to either put you can put one Iona and one Elishnorn, but then you don't know which one you're going to get. You could put two Ionas or two Elishnorns, uh, but you also don't know which one you're going... You don't know which one you're going to need in that case. And while Elishnorn is nice and fine and everything, she has the opposite problem that Iona has. Your opponent can still combo kill you out of that. Um, which is, again, the case for Emrakul as well. But Elishnorn also doesn't benefit from... Yes, she, she shrinks your opponent's creatures, so the fair plan is out for them, but you don't really care about the Lord ability, the plus two, plus two to your other creatures. You have... <laughs> you might have other creatures, it's possible. Ink Moth Nexus, Cloud Form, Vidalkin Shackles, Batter Skull. You might have other creatures, but not, it's not terribly likely that you do. Um, so that's, that's an instance where, yeah, you could maybe side in two Elishnorns. I can see that. Maybe side in one Elishnorn. Um, but that's not necessarily where you want to be. Well, what about Platinum Angel? Um, an easier to kill Iona, I guess? Uh, yes, you, you can't lose, but the opponent will have Artifact Removal they're already sighting in. They'll have Flame Slash, potentially. 
Um, maybe they'll have some ability to fight her or deal with flyers specifically. Uh, Platinum Angel just dies too easily. And you're not getting something explosive like you are in the other cases. Now, where I have seen some success, and this just hap this came up one time, so maybe maybe it's not as good as I think it is. But where I have seen some success is Blazing Archon, or as I like to think of it, 420 Blaze It Archon, 10 out of 10 IGN, Mountain Dew Doritos, Game of the Year, so on and so forth. Um, <laughs> yeah, Blazing Archon. Where is that altarist that had that was at an SCG that I went to and displayed the 420 Blaze It Archon altar, where the sword that was being held out was just this ginormous joint. It was the it was it was hilarious by me anyway. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> back to the deck itself, Emrakul is a card that wins the game for you. Emrakul is a card that, granted, it'll happen in a turn, maybe two, but Emrakul wins you the game. But sometimes you need to not lose the game. That means that you need to actually, <laughs> well, sorry about that, uh, you need to stop your opponent from killing you. Because Emrakul will not have haste, again, unless you have a Lightning Greaves or a Swift Foot Boots, um, and because Emrakul doesn't have haste, your opponent could Splinter Twin kill you in the next turn, they could just have enough creatures on the board that they swing out and kill you, they could burn you. Um, Blazing Archon keeps you from losing, gives you time to go and set up something else. Maybe you find another Blazing Archon, maybe you have an Ink Moth Nexus with Rune Enchanter's Pike that can just keep swinging enough, maybe you can find a Batter Skull to do the same and just your life gets high enough that it doesn't matter anymore, so on and so forth. May it, Blazing Archon stems, or stops the bleeding. So there is an instance when I was playing an Affinity match where if I had not gotten the Blazing Archon, I might have lost the next turn. I, I might have very well. And granted, he still had outs, and we played a much longer game as a result. I hard cast Emrakul. That tells you something about what Blazing Archon can do. This was against Affinity. This was against one of the fastest fairly consistent uh, decks in the format, and Blazing Archon just took that game, got it to a grinding halt. So that's one that actually has done some work for me. It feels a little bit like Platinum Angel, it feels a bit like you can't lose, um, and your opponents can't win, but it has the, uh, it's not an artifact, and it has more toughness. If I had Platinum Angel, he would have just hit it with a Galvanic Blast and swung out which he did have Galvanic Blast in hand. Galvanic Blast is another card that you will come across quite a bit, in all likelihood. Um, that's as many creatures as I can think of off the top of my head that are actually reasonable for that. I guess maybe Jenga Taxius is another one, also fights combo a bit. Gives you an, a lot of cards, loads you up. Um, again, like Grizzlebrand, maybe it's better in a Disrupting Shells shell, like when you're running four Disrupting Shells, or Pact of Negation but probably not in this instance. It's probably not... I mean... It's not as good as Emrakul. It, it's hard for me to make a case that any particular card, especially in the main board, maybe sideboard answers, but especially in the main board, it's hard for me to make the case that anything beats the Flying Spaghetti Monster. Even the other Eldrazi, because you're not casting them with Polymorphs, so the extra ability doesn't matter anyway, and they're being slightly cheaper, probably doesn't matter. You're, <laughs> you're playing a weird game if you're actually hard casting them. But if you do get to that point, Emrakul can't be countered and they can. So, take that for whatever it's worth. Now for sideboard. <laughs> oh, sideboard. After that, I know it must have sounded like a rant and I apologize for it, but I, I have actually tried out other answers and that's just what I came up with. Your mileage may vary. So we are keeping most of the sideboard cards the same, actually. Uh, we're going to keep Aetherize, we're going to keep Basuju, we're going to keep a couple Dispels, we're going to keep Echoing Truth, we're going to keep Hercules Recall, we're going to keep Jace, we're going to keep Pything Needle. Um, all, all of those are still perfectly fine, but we took out six cards. And what did we replace them with? Well, forgive me for one sec. <coughs> Sorry about that. This card is awesome. This card will get you out of so many sticky situations in this format. It's a very low-to-the-ground format, Modern is. 
A little bit less so now that Tasker and Gurmog Angler are around. Now that Siege Rhino is a card, a little bit less so. But this card will still get you out of those situations where your plane gets burned and they just have too many creatures on the ground, they're dealing you too much damage at a time. This will get you out of Voice of Resurgence, this will get you out of Kitchen Finks, this will get you out of Murderous Red Cap. This will get you out of those situations pretty well, I would submit. Um, it's just a good, you were about to lose and now you're not about to lose card. In a lot of cases doesn't target, so if the Boggles player hasn't gotten it big enough yet, the Boggle will die. Um, there's, there are enough dead cards in the match, I think, that we can actually side into Anger of the Gods. We're siding in Anger, we're siding in Aether Eyes, we're siding in... what else are we siding in for that match? Um, well, anyway, anyway. <laughs> uh, that might be it. So, two Rending Volleys. This could very well be Combust. Pay one extra uh, mana to get five damage instead of four. And if you're worried about the card Siege Rhino, by all means, pay the one extra mana. The reason that I prefer Rending Volley is I'm not seeing it, well, a couple of reasons. I'm not seeing as much Siege Rhino, but maybe that's just my meta. Um, and also, one way that Splinter Twin can invalidate Combust, or yeah, Combust, is when they go to tap something, they tap a land, and if they happen to tap one too many lands. If you happen to have two mana beforehand and they tap one down, Combust won't save you. Rending Volley will. So I think that it improves our match against Splinter Twin by enough that it's worth it. It also hits Celestial Colonnade for one mana. That's pretty strong, I would say. Um, so, yes, two Rending Volleys. Now, I keep mentioning Tassiger, Gurmog Angler, and Siege Rhino. Why am I so obsessed with those cards? Because we can't deal with them most ways. We can't. We have Aether Eyes, we have Roast, and we might be able to bounce them to hand with something like Echoing Truth or Snapback to get a little bit of value out of the fact that they have to delve in order to cast un until we get to the very late game. Roast is a way to just outright kill them. Just outright take out that Tasker, take out that Angler, so on and so forth. Uh, now that 5 is such an important number in Modern, why Dismember is so good, for instance, right now, uh, Roast, I think, is actually where we want to be. 2 mana, it's granted it's sorcery speed, but 2 mana, deal with that big guy. Uh, it allows us, I think, to be okay with Rending Volley instead of Combust, because we have another answer to deal with Siege Rhino. We have Roast. And lastly, I've been experimenting with this Vandal Blast. Now, we already have Hercules Recall, that's true. In fact, we have a couple of Hercules Recalls. Maybe that's better. I've seen Blue Moon List, however, try out Vandal Blast. Uh, just as a two of, as a one of, I'm trying it out. It's granted it's much slower, and it doesn't hit their, it doesn't bounce their, uh, their Dark Steel Citadels, for instance. Um, but, and it doesn't bounce their Ink Moth next eye, and Blink Moths when they actually become creatures. And it is sorcery speed, so I can't hit the Ink Moth or the Blink Moth with it just at all. But, but, if I need to survive the early game, Vandal Blast is one way to do it. Hit that cranial plating before it can even start to deal me a fair bit of damage. Um, that's one of the key cards that I have an issue with, that I have a hard time dealing with. With which I have a hard time dealing. Uh, and just any mass destruction like this, you could also try Shatterstorm, goes a long way to helping uh, fight Arcbound Ravager. Uh, obviously, they can still have tricks to get around that. Uh, dumping everything onto... <laughs> I guess you can dump it to... What's an indestructible artifact creature that's in this? Like, in Soul Artifact on a Darksteel Citadel? That could do something. Um, anyway, there, there are tricks that they have, but Vandal Blast I've been trying out. It hasn't come up in a game, so I, d I can't speak to it being better or worse than Hercules Recall, uh, but it's something to consider. Now, the Boogeyman. One thing that you could do, you can try this out. Uh, if you got rid of the Ink Moth Nexi, and if you replace them perhaps with more islands, or like you can replace them with Sulphur Falls, with Cascade Bluffs, if you were to do that, then Blood Moon becomes a much, much better card. Especially if you're replacing them with actual islands. 
you're keeping Vidalkin Shackles on, and you're kind of turning into a Blue Moon deck a little bit. I think that you could try out Blood Moon. The reason that I don't is because Ink Moth Nexus is such a good card in this match, or in, in general. Ink Moth Nexus Rune Chanter's Pike is crazy good. I get about as many kills from that as I do the Polymorph combo itself. Um, but there are some matches where it may be completely worth it. Uh, if you're playing against Bloom Titan, if you don't have Blood Moon, you might not be able to beat them. Uh, you could try Spreading Seas to do something against them as well. Turn their two man, turn their Karu into one mana instead of two. That's certainly something. Um, but Blood Moon against some decks just says you can't win. Deal with this first, which Scape Shift can do, um, which Bloom Titan can do a little bit with, say, a Swan Song or a Seal of Primordium or the one basic forest. But let's face it, that's that's really tricky for them. So if that's something that you're worried enough about, give Blood Moon a go. Uh, what you might replace it with, Ether Eyes is maybe the one that's most on the chopping block of all the cards here. Pything Needle, maybe, but I'd like that it fights Ad Nauseam um, and can deal with Liliana, which is certainly a way to beat us. And so you can try these out. Uh, Feel free to disagree with some of the decisions I've made if you'd like. Uh, you can discuss it in the comments. And I will see you all later. Thank you very much for watching these videos, and thank you very much for uh, supporting the channel, for commenting, for liking, for, for subscribing. And look, it's not even that long before we get to my 500th video and my 2000th sub. Uh, hopefully everything, hopefully, maybe we can get those two to coincide, and that'll be really cool. I have, I have an idea for a video that is actually going to require some choreography. It's, it's that, it's that cool. Um, we're going to try to get that to work for you. Um, one more time before I actually uh, let you all go, uh, part of the inspiration for this Is It Brew um, was Travis Wu. Uh, I'll say Travis Wu came up with a Polymorph Through the Breach Storage Lands deck. You can, there's a video down here, you can check it out, or at least there's a link. Um, because he's an awesome dude, he's, in my experience, he's really nice. Uh, he brews like I, well, I don't know about like I do, but he brews as well. And his brews are pretty fun, pretty interesting. And I, I do look up to him, so... He, his brew was an inspiration for mine to a certain extent, and uh, also shout outs to um, your YouTube username is Ma Jong for giving me some idea. You're actually the one that introduced me to the idea of is it polymorph? Not introduced me, I, I, kn I knew the color combination existed, but some of the ideas that you brought up, like is it charm, for instance, or some of the sideboard cards. Uh, that was awesome, that helped. I, I very strongly considered putting in the Faithless Looting you brought up as well. I just, I think it's better, I think that the, any of the cards here are better than a Faithless Looting. Maybe the Spell Snare, maybe. Maybe the Repeal, not sure. Um, so shout outs to you as well. Um, shout outs to, I don't think he would mind, uh, well maybe he would, so just in case I won't say his actual name. Uh, shout outs to Nick? We'll say Nick. That's a name. We'll say Nick. Uh, for another idea, uh, one way that you can use the Misty Rainforest, if you, if you want to, is you can replace one of these lands with a breeding pool, and you can go for a sideboard ancient grudge. And that's an idea of his. I didn't take it. You can go for it, though. Take a one breeding pool, ancient grudge, flashback ancient grudge, can do wonders against not just affinity, but any list that you strongly suspect is going to be bringing in good sideboard hate against you like uh, Graf Digger's Cage or Spellskite. Uh, so give that a, uh, I would say give his, give his channel a look, but he doesn't have a channel, I'm afraid. I, I wish he did so I could throw him a shout out. Um, same thing with, I think he wouldn't mind, I think the next guy wouldn't mind, Evan. Evan, you're awesome, you also dropped an idea for this deck, and I think that that's really cool of you. Um, you were the one that brought up uh, Batterskull. Uh, in the main board. Now, in the I added in the sideboard at the time, but you brought up Batterskull in the main, and it has done some work. <laughs> that thing is a workhorse. In the right match, 
it actually it, it shows its its true glory. Unfortunately, it's five mana, and modern is a fast enough format. You know, it is after all a turn four format for a reason. That's why they call it that. But when you can make it to the longer game, fighting mid range, fighting control, uh, batter skull can just overwhelm their ability to kill a creature. Just bring it back, try again. Bring it back, try again. In a, in control matches that are fair, unlike control decks that aren't fair, like mine. Um, Batter Skull can just do work on its own. Um, I think that's all the shoutouts for this deck. I, I guess shoutouts to Ryan for helping me test this deck a bit. Uh, shoutouts to Dragonstar Hobbies for <laughs> giving me a place to record and to, and to... I feel like I'm the credits at the end of a movie. <laughs> and to playtest. Dragonstar is just awesome like that. And <laughs> thank you very, very much. YouTube, I, uh, I am very glad to be able to make these videos for you. <laughs> Alright, so... <laughs> you guys are awesome. I'm gonna pack it in, and I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye!